Welcome to the Sticky Note Marketing Show. I'm your host, Mary Zarnecki. Business leaders today are overwhelmed with a unique set of challenges, from rapidly changing markets to digital disruptions, leaving many uncertain about where to focus their efforts to grow their brands and their businesses. This uncertainty can lead to missed opportunities, wasted resources, and stagnant growth, but it doesn't have to be this way. On this show, I provide clear, actionable strategies and bring in guest experts that cut through the noise and deliver consistent results. I share what works and what doesn't when it comes to effective marketing and growing your business. Tune in to discover the latest insights and proven tactics to make your marketing more profitable, lead your teams with confidence, and achieve success for your brand, business, and personal aspirations. If you've ever wondered if it's possible to skip the overwhelm and map out a plan for success on a simple sticky note, I'm here to tell you that it is. So grab that pen and those sticky notes and let's get started. Hello and welcome to this episode of the Sticky Note Marketing Show. My name is Mary Zarnecki and I am your host today bringing you another guest expert in our series. So excited here to have Dylan Kenneth share his insights and gold nuggets with you today. Dylan is the mastermind behind OmniRank, a digital marketing agency that helps e-commerce and Amazon sellers succeed online. Welcome Dylan to the show. Super happy, excited to have you here. Thank you, Marie. Hopefully I can provide some nuggets so people can put it on their sticky notes and put it on their computer. Yes, that's a great reminder. Thank you. So if you're listening or watching this, grab those sticky notes. We want to make sure that you're getting lots of actionable tips to install in your business as soon as possible. So Dylan, I know there are some people that might be familiar with you, big fans of you already listening here, but some people may be meeting you for the first time. So can you help us just understand a little bit about OmniRank and how you were inspired to create this? Sure, sure. So I found the Omerang since I was bootstrapping my brand. It was like a byproduct because I am actually a Amazon seller back in the days, eBay Amazon seller. And then I find myself, I need capital to scale my brand. And that's why I started offering service to client. Like the, our first client is actually Chinese. And then they asked me to help them on the Amazon PPC. Along the time, they realized that Amazon PPC is no longer a viable route on just focusing on Amazon. They wanted to scale past Amazon. They want to diversify their risk. And that's why they started to ask me, hey, could you help us to launch this outside of Shopify? And before I start working on Amazon, I was actually working for a job shipping company. And that exact experience I have leading me to go from just focusing on Amazon to launching brand and help them launch different product outside of Amazon and on Amazon itself. So that's the story of Omirank. Got it. So you've walked in their shoes, right? If there are folks listening or watching today that have started their own business and and are trying to figure out really how to get from that starter phase to the growth phase or from the growth phase to the scale phase, you've gone through it, you've done it. (laughs) It is, yeah. That's fantastic. I know one of the things that you had shared with me is that sellers need to be very strategic and thoughtful and intentional about where they're putting their products. So Amazon, obviously, Amazon has plenty of people on that platform, but there might be other things that they want to think about. So when you're advising today's e-commerce sellers, where should they start? How should they start thinking about, do I stay on Amazon? Do I keep that as my home base? Where else should I be? Yeah. So when it comes to starting a business, it's all about validating the idea. Starting in Amazon, starting in eBay or Kickstarter or maybe your own website, they have, all they are is just a different framework. But then eventually, like they all lead to one place, which is brand building, right? And so when going back to the questions and where should they start, it should be about like whether or not their product is a commodity, whether or not if they are a if they come with interactive marketing, unique selling point that can sell on Facebook, or would that be a viral product that a feature is good enough to put it on social commerce? Or maybe would that be a innovative product, like a potential product that could be on Kickstarter? So that would be the first question we have to ask ourselves. What are the product that you're selling? And that would normally find out, will help you find out, oh, you should start on this place first and then or you can start on that place first. So it's all about, comes down to the product itself. 
Got it. So if the product itself is more of a commodity, you might recommend certain platforms. If it has more unique value or unique potential, they might want to consider something else. Yeah. Got it. Now, you mentioned something like becoming viral and becoming a sensation and TikTok marketplace. Is there anything that you're seeing as indicators, right? Early on when you're looking at different e-commerce sellers and you're saying, oh, okay, that one has potential to really go big. Are there certain indicators that you notice in brands or in products that people could look out for? Yeah. So what happened is we normally go for a product validation. So we help them validate their product first, <laughs> whether or not, okay, sorry, first person first, before you even touch the product, we have a check for you right so we help you to decide what kind of unique point that you're developing or whether or not this product can go for bundling or this product could be having upsell and downsell to increase the average order value or our lifetime value is that like a subscription product that could people come back over and over again so those are checklists like whether or not if we, when we recommend you to go through that uh, checklist to, in order to get a sense of, okay, in the future, there's a finite scalable. So if you sell on Amazon, normally that's going to be just material or maybe uh, just shape difference, or maybe a one added feature. But then if you do it on Kickstarter, it might be one unique selling point, one, one more selling point that is enough to differentiate yourself with the competitors, like a oven baking tray, a oven baking tray is just a commodity. And then now you would say, I want to do something special so I can put it on Amazon. So comes up with modular oven baking tray, a big square of baking tray. They chop it down into three, become modular, right? But then you want to make it better. So you want to try on Kickstarter. So you would just add a handle on the oven baking tray on that free modular baking tray. And now you got a solution for typical stay at home on for just not using a steel plate baking tray or maybe uh just like wrapping foil you are actually saving them money you are actually saving them from being burning their hand and that is enough to put it on kickstarter so that's the idea on how we help you to find out your product first after that we move on to product validation so in the product validation we normally do you know typical social media questioning like by building a pro a poll like you go on a create a poll on Facebook, ask them, is this something that you want? Is this something that you, you prefer or how we can help you out further? So that's a basic engagement test. You want to see whether or not people is engaging with you in one of those polls, right? So when people is engaging with you, it means that they, hey, you have already passed the first step. So there's three steps. Sorry, I, I mentioned that. So it's a three step product validation funnel that we have there to become this uh, future proof product launch formula. So uh, once you pass the engagement test, you want to go for second step, which is you want to know the competition in the market. In By meaning of competition, it's not just about Amazon competition. It's not just about how many competition in the market. Because competition always exists in the market. Say, early on, we are using the oven baking tray, right? You already have very competitors. They are using, they have different variety of baking tray. They are, there's silicon, there's like paper, there's steel or whatever it is. There's always a lot of, of like different competitors in the market. Mm -hmm. So in the second stage, what we're doing right now is actually running ad on Facebook, right? A place that would really brutally tell you the truth, whether or not your product has a potential, mm -hmm. right? By doing that, you can know how much does it cost to generate a lead. Right. And when they generate, when you generate a lead, whether or not people is like engaging with your Facebook ad saying that they need one or are they clicking to the link to the landing page? So now you get two steps. First step, you do Facebook polling. And now second step, you open up your product to the public and look at the open interest, right? Once you pass through those, you realize your CPC is around maybe less than two is quite a good indicator that your product has a a, has a potential that doesn't really just sell a commodity that wouldn't generate interest in the market. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now you have a interest. Now you have uh, the cost per click and now you're entering into the first step. It's about asking them to commit, right? To really know it, whether or not they really want to buy it in the first step engagement test. Hey, they have no commitment. That's why you don't really know whether or not you're going to generate interest or to generate purchase in the future. Second step is about finding the right audience, doing the prospecting. 
right? The prospecting is important because during the prospecting stage, uh, you're trying to know, okay, baking tray, this is just good for mom. Does it mean all the dad hates cooking? And then you might yeah. find out, oh, actually there's some chef that is all around the world. And then they are actually quite engaging. They like the idea. So that means by prospecting, maybe you will find someone else who are not just chef. They could be just like people who are disabled. They prefer that, something like that, right? Or maybe age difference. Those are prospecting, right? Mm -hmm. But that still doesn't tell you uh, that they're going to buy in the future, right? Now you want to use you want to use a validation funnel, ask them to commit $1, $2, $3, to know that whether or not in the future, we're going to sell it for $40. I'm going to give you some perks. Are you going to buy for with us in the future? And then you will go on to test out in the second stage, there is like a five different prospects that you have find out. You're going to run at targeting those five different prospects. And then you'll find out, oh, which prospect, which prospect actually convert? That might not be the, might be the good choice. Disabled person might be the good choice. It all depends on the data. Whoever actually convert the most page reserve the, in the validation funnel. It means that, hey, this product can sell to this kind of audience and therefore your copy or your creative should always include those kind of like creative that resonate to those kind of audience. And so now you have run this free validation step before you even start a business. That's what we're using to avoid people to just go into the trap to say, hey, I go into this software, tell me there's this much of enough of impression and then this impression will generate this amount of revenue. They are all just numbers and then everyone is seeing that. And therefore using the method that I just talked about, we are actually validating what really works. Sometimes it takes one, two, three times, free kind of testing for you to find out the right product. But that would be better than you spending 90 days worth of, uh, spending money on buying 90 days worth of inventory and send it to the warehouse, but it doesn't convert. That is actually a way worse situation than you start testing and losing money on testing. And by, the, by that mean of decreasing your risk when launching a product. Yeah. First of all, I hope everyone had their sticky notes out because Dylan just shared a ton of valuable information with you guys if you're watching and listening carefully. It's so funny because I had flashbacks to when you were saying it's better to validate before you start buying inventory to my days when I was back in marketing. And that's what would happen if they didn't do their test markets because then they'd end up with a warehouse full of things being like, okay, marketing and sales team, we got to go sell this. Right? So then all of a sudden it shifts. But I love what you were focusing on, which is if people are doing this, if we're not saying, oh, we've already got a product and now we have to sell it, that's not the ideal scenario. What we really want to do is actually see what's out there. Like you said, what are the existing dissatisfactions? So great, people are using that product, but what could be better? What could be better? What could be innovative? What could be a better experience for them? Could we do that? And not just could we do that, like it sounds good in our brains, but now let's go actually ask people. And I love, I wrote this down on my sticky note which was interest versus purchase intent. I think that's something that a lot of entrepreneurs I have spoken to who've said, oh, I wish I had known was, oh, I did the poll and it came back great. And people said it was a great idea. But then when we ask people to put money on the line, it can be a very different story. So do you have any experiences with that? Like any folks that had to learn the hard way in terms of thinking there was going to be demands, but then when they actually ask people to put money on the line, it was a different story. Yes, I'm going to put myself on the spot. Okay. <laughs> uh, it was my player in the past because I ran around just my product. I ran around six Kickstarter campaign. And then in the early days before I really find out the hard way that I really run this product validation funnel, I developed a product called Organize. Mm -hmm. So Organize is actually something going to be on the wall. I wish I can show you because it's actually behind you. <laughs> it's actually behind the wall. Okay. Let me see if I can show you. So wall organized. So wall organization. Yeah, this is wall organized. Oh, okay. We'll have to, you'll have to send me a picture. We'll put it on. In yeah, the... <laughs> I will show you that. Yeah. But the story behind here is in this product, I generated, I generated around 60K on, on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. right? Which is like not a bad thing, right? Yeah. But if I do the product gym validation funnel first, I will know that this is not a good product to start with. Mm. Yeah, this is okay. Seems amazing. But then what's after that I realized, right, I'm trying to create a product from scratch. There's, mm. I'm trying to create a product that is not existing in the market, right? And 
I realize if I've done that validation first, and if I know that funnel first, then I will know that, okay, I need to I, I need not to create a, a, a market. I need to modify what's been existing in the market. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I learned in the hard way. If I know that, like I have done the validation funnel first, I wouldn't be say right now, I think I can scale this. If now I have like five different brand myself and then I scale them all past seven figures, no, two is six figures and then all past seven figures for other brand. It tells me that if I didn't, if I didn't create the demand on the uh, actual product, I shouldn't be, if I, I didn't, if I didn't get the synergy in the market, the synergy comes with what's in the market, existing in the market mm -hmm. and then what you create that become the synergy. Yeah. But then if you're just one sided, just you are the one who will create the product, but then you don't have the capital to really, to let everyone to know about this product. And then your audience is actually, it's just so limited, which is organized, right? Remember in step two, I also, I talk about prospecting. The reason why prospecting is important is because you need to know how many audience you have. Whereas organized, I can only find around three to four prospects. In fact, in the synergy, if you are doing a product that comes with synergy, it already comes with a bunch of prospects. Could be 10, 20, 30, because a lot of people are having demand in this niche, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore, doing the funnel testing is important. And therefore, I'm providing this example to let you know what I have failed. And I hope you guys learn from that. I really appreciate you being honest and sorry for all organized, but it is true. I think you highlight something that we talk about in marketing all the time, which is sometimes people aren't even aware that they have a problem. So now you're going to have to spend money even helping them recognize the problem, be invested in solving that problem, and then give them the solution to that problem. As opposed to, like you were saying, if it's a product in the market that they're using, but they're dissatisfied with, there's something that could be better. They already are aware of that. They already see the need for it. They already are familiar with it. You're not trying to educate them on needing the thing. You're educating them only on how, what you're offering can be better than their current experience. So it's a much shorter bridge to cross, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's a really good point. Awesome. So when you were sharing a couple thoughts earlier, one of the other things you mentioned was not putting all of your eggs in one basket. So if I could ask one last question, if there are folks out there thinking, okay, am I going to be a one hit wonder? Am I going to have one, one product and then that's all I'm going to need? Or does sometimes a product hit, but then we have to have something ready to go next? What's your philosophy? As I told you, I'm a, I, I have my own brand. I launched different product in multi-platform. Yep. I'm going to put my step on the spot again. Okay. I will tell you what happened to me and I hope the audience can learn the hard way. <laughs> when we are launching, so we first started on eBay. Mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you like what I've encountered along the way. We started on eBay. We get suspended. We only have one account in eBay. And then we, and therefore I move on to Amazon. On mm -hmm. Amazon, it was all good at first. I sell, I, I scaled to seven figures in maybe uh, under one and a half years. Mm -hmm. We got suspended and then like our inventory got we have around back in the days our we have 200k inventory in amazon 100k in the warehouse the cash flow just not rolling in wow. our company is expanding we are hiring a lot of like virtual assistant and in-house as well in all sudden all the money is just stopped our running cost was like 10k a month and in all sudden like you took and then in all sudden that like, amazon just suspended account we are supposed to get around 40k a month in in return in cash in this in, in the disbursement and then we it just all stopped so that was the lowest part of my time back in the days i think it's like four to five years ago and then okay now i realize i need more accounts so i get my sister my my friends my family account and i've just all set up and now they're all stable okay next we move on to because we expanded business to to kickstarter to job shipping to our external traffic what do we rely on we rely on Amazon, I rely on Facebook ad, right? In Facebook ad, horror story, you could have just get suspended easily back in time before COVID, during COVID, we always get suspended. And then horror story again, right? We have like one third of the revenue line just got down because we were like doing quite well on outside of Amazon as well, on Shopify. And then 
no, we were like, why? What? We have already collected all the data. And then that data is supposed to, to be for us to do the repurposing for our targeting. And then in all of that, all of a sudden, like we cannot utilize those because like our account just got suspended. We cannot look, we cannot use the lookalike audience, etc. So that is actually a very big problem. And what, why do I get suspended? Because of policy changes, because of blanket ban means like back in the days, there was like some presidential uh, campaign is doing, is running. And then Facebook want to reduce anything that is sensitive mm -hmm. or COVID, they prefer like those keywords not to be used. And therefore, like you just go suspended out of the blue. And therefore, if you aren't diversifying your risk in different platform, then when it comes to the systematic risk, if they hit you, you're going to be running around borrowing money to save your company. I bet this is not what you want as well. And therefore diversify, but not putting all that in one basket is important. Even though right now we have like different channels, we have four channels, we have Kickstarter, Shopify, Amazon, right? And then we still wanted to, we, we still get suspended. If one channel gets shut down, our impact is just going to be 25%, right? But then if you only have like one channel, when you get shut down, your impact is going to be 100%. And then you got nowhere to go. You're just going to be crying and then maybe <laughs> just begging for Amazon or other platform to give you the account back. Yeah. No, it's so true. And those things happen frequently, right? This isn't just once in a blue moon. This is something mm -hmm. that happens to people all the time, every day. And like you said, it's not even that, oh, I'm operating correctly, but there might be a policy change. There might be a keyword that all of a sudden they don't like, or there's just a change and you just happen to get caught up in that. And there goes your account, right? So better to have those other diversifications. I'm sure everyone has a lot more questions for you, but we have to at some point wrap up our interview today. So I know there are going to be people who want to follow up with you, Dylan. What is the best way to connect with you? I know we can include all of your links with this episode, but if someone was going to go find you online, what's the best place to go connect with you online? It will be in LinkedIn, Digital Dylan. And if you want to get the checklist I, checklist I mentioned before you start the business or even the, the checklist really applies to product, the funnel that I talk about could apply to B2B as well. If you want to learn more about it, come and talk to me on LinkedIn. Fantastic. Digital mm -hmm. Dylan on LinkedIn. And we'll make sure to include that link where we mm -hmm. have this episode, whether you're watching or listening today. So thank you so much, Dylan, for joining us on the Sticky Note Marketing Show and sharing your knowledge, expertise, and experience with our audience. Thank you, Marie, for having me. Thanks. Cheers. And I'll see everyone else on the next episode of Sticky Note Marketing. Thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Sticky Note Marketing Show. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, leave a review, and share it with others who might benefit. Until next time, keep it simple and stay focused.